My name is Katie, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Biogen fourth quarter and full year 2023 earnings call and business update. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Please limit yourself to one question to allow other participants time for questions. If you require any further follow-up, you may press star 1 again to rejoin the queue. Today's conference is being recorded. Thank you. I would now like to turn the conference over to Mr. Chuck Triano, Head of Investor Relations. Mr. Triano, you may begin your conference. Thank you, Katie. Good morning and welcome to Biogen's fourth quarter and full year 2023 earnings call. Before we begin, I'll remind you that the earnings release and related financial tables, including our GAAP financial measures and a reconciliation of the GAAP to non-GAAP financial measures that we will discuss today, are located in the investors section of Biogen.com. Our GAAP financials are provided in tables one and two, and table four includes a reconciliation of our GAAP to non-GAAP financial results. We believe non-GAAP financial results better represent the ongoing economics of our business and reflect how we manage the business internally. We have also posted the slides on our website that will be used during this call. I'd like to point out also that we'll be making forward-looking statements which are based on our expectation. These statements are subject to certain risks and uncertainties and our actual results may differ materially. I encourage you to consult the risk factors discussed in our SEC filings for additional detail. On today's call, I'm joined by our President and Chief Executive Officer, Chris Fiebacher, Dr. Priya Singhal, Head of Development, and our CFO, Mike McDonald. Chris, Priya, and Mike will each make some opening comments, and then we'll move to our Q&A session. To allow us to get through as many questions as possible, we ask that you limit yourself to one question. With that, I'll now turn the call over to Chris. Thank you, Chuck. Good morning, everybody. Uh, a year ago, I had the uh, honor and opportunity of presenting uh, uh, Biogen's quarterly results for the first time. Uh, at that time, um, we expressed the objective of returning Biogen to sustainable growth. And I think in the intervening year, we've made substantial progress. Um, and today, it, it, it is a great, uh, with a great amount of pride and pleasure that we can uh, announce uh, earnings guidance, which Mike will go into in greater detail, which says that we, will, um, we are expecting to see uh, positive earnings per share growth. And, you know, as I have said uh, on a number of occasions, uh, once we can get Biogen growing, we really see Biogen becoming a, a growth company for the foreseeable future. Um, we have uh, very little, we have, in fact, no uh, exposure to uh, Inflation Reduction Act um, uh, with our current portfolio. We um, don't have any new patent expiries really uh, coming in any time soon other than those that are already known. Um, and I think we've undertaken a number of other measures that um, really uh, reposition uh, Biogen for growth. And if I just review some of those things, um, the first is, is was really to <clears throat> refocus the company on growth drivers, in particular our new product launches. Uh, Biogen had four new product launches from uh, approvals from the FDA last year. That's the second highest of anyone in our industry. And, you know, that required, though, quite an awful lot of cultural change. Um, the multiple sclerosis uh, franchise has been the stalwart of our company for since its inception 45 years ago. Um, our people are passionate about the physicians um, uh, who treat uh, multiple sclerosis and the patients who, who um, have multiple sclerosis. Uh, and we are still a market leader in, in this space. However, um, that is a franchise that is, is facing increasing uh, competition, and we have to embrace new therapeutic categories and, and, and new businesses. And so we have um, really had a major shift in resources and focus, particularly towards uh, Lakembi, uh, Zerzuve, uh, Skyclaris, and, and Calsadi. We also, though, have still some products with patent protection, um, again, with substantial competition, um, and if I take a product like Spinraza, analyst forecasts had, uh, had uh, shown forecasts that this product would decline. 
particularly proud of our teams in demonstrating that they could bring this product uh, back to uh, actually even modest growth. Um, obviously, you know, the mode of administration of products is can be a competitive advantage. So if you have a pill, you're going to be a lot um, more preferred than if you have an infusion, for example. But what we see in some of these really devastating diseases is that efficacy is still the most important factor. And that is why, you know, Spinraza continues to be a, a leader in its segment. And, you know, Biogen is extremely good at being able to develop the medical evidence to support the the value proposition of its its products. As many of you told me when I first came into the company, um, you know, you've got a mature product portfolio, but you, you've got one of the highest cost bases in our industry, and uh, we took steps to address that. We, But it wasn't just around reducing cost. We wanted to re-engineer the business. We were shifting our focus, um, entering new therapeutic categories, and we needed to think about capabilities. We needed to think about the agility of the organization, the number of layers of management that we have. And so we implemented a fit-for-growth um, re-engineering project. Um, we've already achieved $200 million of, of savings, and we're on track to um, realize approximately half of the $800 million of net savings by the end of uh, 2024. Um, that's, of course, a, a gross savings of a of billion dollars. And then, you know, uh, we had to look at research and development. And, you know, Biogen is an extremely interesting company. Um, all of the diseases that Biogen targets are really devastating diseases. And we target, uh, and, and there's a lot of pride in the fact that we, we go and try to find uh, solutions for diseases where nobody else is doing that. But, of course, when you do that, you're pioneering. Um, you're pioneering because we don't really understand often the underlying disease biology of these uh, conditions. And so we end up taking uh, a lot of risk, and, and, and these trials can be really quite expensive. And yet we do need a company uh, like Biogen in our, in our world. And so our objective has been to, to really focus uh, research and development investments on those products that will have the greatest impact. Um, and, and, of course, we have to manage the risk in the portfolio. We, we have to have Biogen as a, a sustainably growing company and one which is attractive to investors. We need the capital to go and invest in, in new projects. And so uh, I think uh, with Priya's help, we've been able to take an extremely disciplined and objective view to the pipeline. Uh, we have four data readouts uh, this year, again, on, on extremely uh, important illnesses, and, and Priya will talk more about that. And, and as we go into next year, we're going to be looking at how do we reinforce that pipeline? How do we um, rethink our research uh, efforts? Uh, a lot has changed in science, but we haven't necessarily done that kind of change at Biogen. <clears throat> so I think uh, research and development is extremely important to Biogen, and I think um, continue to uh, be a source of growth for the future. Now, as we look at what does drive uh, growth, clearly we have Lakembi. And, you know, I'll remind everybody that, uh, again, we are not just pioneering in science, but pioneering in commercial. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, this disease is that, you know, if we talk about the efficacy of the product, you know, a lot of cases we're looking at um, the characteristic of a product. But actually, when you talk about efficacy, you talk about are you in the right patient? And in fact, for decades, our industry uh, invested in, in drugs which failed to, to demonstrate a benefit in Alzheimer's disease. And there were two main problems with that. One was we couldn't get enough drug across the blood-brain barrier, and we weren't in the right patient. Clarity was the first study to really uh, convincingly demonstrate the, the importance of reducing plaque and the, the impact on, on cognition. But we know that from data that we showed at, at CTAD, that we believe that the earlier uh, you can go, um, the, the more likely it is you're going to show even a greater efficacy because we're not, you know, our, we're really in the business of trying to protect neurons or create an environment where injured neurons can, can recover. And, and so we have uh, a huge investment in, in our AHEAD study to look at uh, pre-symptomatic patients. We're investing in what happens when you remove the plaque and, and, and uh, looking at maintenance. Um, we're trying to make this more um, um, convenient for patients uh, by having a subcutaneous formulation. And so this, this 
the pioneering continues. And the pioneering also is out there in the marketplace. Patients with Alzheimer's are not in the system today and are coming into the system. So we've got approximately 2,000 patients on therapy um, at the moment. Now, we don't have, as companies, direct access to the, to the patient registries. You all know about the CMS registry, but there are a few other um, registries out there, like Altsnet, for example. And um, we have seen some analysts have been able to access that data. Um, uh, there was one analyst report of 3,300 patients on the registry. Uh, latest information that we have, and again, this is not perfect information, but we have an indication that there are about 3,800 patients as of last week on the registry. When you look at that, that suggests we're we're getting about uh, 260, 265 patients per week in the month of January. And as far as we can tell, that's about a 56% increase over what we were seeing in December. So we are clearly seeing that there is demand for the product. Uh, we're clearly seeing that uh, IDNs are moving to put in place the, the care pathways and the treatment protocols to improve access. Um, 70 out of the, the top 100 IDNs have had positive P&T committee decisions. 80% um, of those have now actually ordered Lakembi. But, you know, if we talk to the people who are doing the PET scans, the MRIs, the people who sell uh, the blood diagnostics, everybody is reporting increased um, activity and, and volume. And so, uh, and, and as you saw with ASI's results, um, their belief is that, you know, for all the patients on, on treatment, there are at least uh, uh, three or fourfold of those who are actually um, in, in waiting rooms. So, um, we, we do believe we're making a very solid progress, um, and, and we believe that we have validated the go-to-market model. And now that we have enough IDNs with reimbursement and uh, care pathways in place, um, we believe it's also time now to, to increase um, uh, our level of promotion out there. And so, um, as ASI has announced, we will be uh, expanding uh, total U.S. Uh, field force by about 30%. And as was already previously agreed last year, that once we had the go-to-market uh, model um, uh, really validated, that it's now time for Biogen colleagues to also um, uh, go and visit uh, physicians. And, and of course, we've we've seen the launch in Japan. I was I was there for the launch meeting, and uh, Biogen is very proud to be working uh, alongside our colleagues from ASI on the launch in in Japan. And, and we've seen uh, that can be approved in China, and, and that launch will be for later this year. So everywhere we look with Lakembi, um, uh, we are making solid progress. This is, as we have said before, an, uh, a launch that really doesn't have an analog. We have always guided investors to the fact that this would be a progressive ramp, and, and that's what we're seeing. And uh, we continue to believe in the, in the long-term importance of, of Lakembi both to patients and to our financial results. Moving on to Sky Claris, um, you know, uh, you, you've seen the, uh, the the launch numbers for the for the U.S. Um, we have about a thousand patients now on therapy. Uh, we don't have a pediatric indication yet, so the uh, potential population is about 4,500, so we've got a little over 20 percent of the uh, patients on therapy um, within about six months of, of launch. There's an awful lot of complexity to launching um, these rare diseases, and I think this is where Biogen has an awful lot of strength. Um, there's a lot of logistics issues with specialty pharmacy and, and reimbursement, and so uh, we have already been able to demonstrate that we can reduce the time from the start form to shipment by 45%. Uh, we've got about uh, two-thirds coverage out there um, in terms of reimbursement. And, and of course, uh, patients and, and their physicians need an awful lot of uh, support out there. And so we have uh, patient services and family access managers who are assisting patients and physicians to navigate the care pathways. One of the things that we see with Spinraza is that we do about a, a third of our sales in the U.S. and two-thirds ex-U.S. And we expect that to be um, a model for Sky Claris. Um, last night, we, we uh, announced the formal approval by the European Commission for Sky Claris. Um, we have an expanded access program in a number of European countries, and we are um, in the process of, of setting those up uh, in other countries, including those outside of the, the U.S. Uh, we have a, a global filing strategy that is underway to make sure that uh, all patients with uh, um, Friedrich's ataxia can benefit from um, from uh, Sky Claris, 
And of course, uh, we are actively working on um, the studies that would be needed to obtain the indication for, for children under age 16. Uh, Zerzuve, uh, postpartum depression, enormous uh, unmet need. Uh, tremendous media coverage. Um, you, you know, we're talking about maternal health and we're also talking about mental health. And, and those are two key trends in, in our societies to, today. Um, it has been uh, difficult to often for, for mothers to seek treatment and get treatment. Uh, it's estimated about 80,000 women are diagnosed every year, but the, the incidence is believed to be uh, way in excess of a half a million. So there's an awful lot of work to do to really get outreach to, to uh, women um, who are suffering from postpartum depression. I have to say, uh, the initial indications of launch are, are well above expectations and very promising. Um, but, you know, it's six weeks of data, so uh, I think we want to see more data to really come to uh, any firm conclusions. But um, everything that we are seeing is, is, is extremely positive. Um, you know, we were originally uh, positioning this product for uh, major depressive disorder, and we pivoted to postpartum depression. That meant we've had to go back and recontract with payers. Um, I have to say I'm, I'm highly appreciative of, of payers because they have actually been honoring prescriptions even though we haven't got all of our contracting uh, in place. And, and I think that is actually also helping um, with demand. So with that, um, I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to Priya uh, because I think uh, increasingly uh, what we'd like to, to also start to talk about is not only what we're selling, but the, the new hope uh, for patients that's coming out of our pipeline. So I'll turn that over to you, Priya. Thank you, Chris. As we previously discussed, we have focused on reviewing and prioritizing our development pipeline with a keen eye towards maximizing probability of success and increasing potential return on investment, as Chris noted. The intention was always to focus our pipeline to better represent a risk-reward balance and one that we believe could help Biogen reach the goal of achieving sustainable growth. While this effort resulted in a number of program discontinuations last year, specifically in areas we perceived significant regulatory development or commercialization challenges, we also highlighted areas where we had deep expertise and promising pipeline programs and therefore warranted an invest to win approach. One such area is Alzheimer's disease, where we have an industry leading pipeline and we do expect to continue investing in order to expand our leadership. This starts first with building upon our opportunity with Lakembi. Our first priority is to continue working with ASI to help ensure that Lakembi is available globally to patients suffering from early Alzheimer's disease. With approvals now obtained in the US, Japan, and China, and filings currently under review in 14 additional markets, we believe we are well on our way to achieving this goal. Second is creating additional treatment options for patients. The data presented at CTAD last year on Lakembi suggests that there is continued benefit associated with treatment out to 24 months, and that treatment earlier in the disease course had a greater effect on clinical outcomes. For this reason, we are working with ASI to submit a filing for maintenance dosing with IV Lakembi or every four-week treatment, as well as evaluating Lakembi administration in preclinical AD, as Chris mentioned in the AHEAD 345 trial, which is before the onset of symptoms. ESI also aims to submit a filing for subcutaneous version of Lakembi by the end of March. Beyond Lakembi, Biogen is also advancing pipeline programs targeting tau. We believe tau represents the next frontier in Alzheimer's therapeutics, and we are working to support the development of diagnostic tests and pathways. Our ASO targeting tau, BBT, represents a new mechanism for targeting tau, distinct from prior antibody attempts. In the phase 1b study, we saw a convergence of target engagement, reduction in tau pathology in the brain, and improvement in exploratory measures of clinical outcomes. We are very encouraged by these results 
and are currently evaluating BIB-80 in the Phase two Celia study. We also have BIB-113, a Phase one small molecule aiming to reduce the aggregation of tau. Importantly, Jane and the research organization is also focused on the future of Alzheimer's treatments and is pursuing a multi-modality approach to evaluate a number of other potential targets implicated in Alzheimer's disease biology. Looking beyond Alzheimer's disease, Biogen has an opportunity to expand our growing rare disease portfolio. We see rare disease expertise as a core competency at Biogen. I will now address BIB-121 in Angelman syndrome. Angelman syndrome is a rare genetic neurodevelopmental disorder that occurs in approximately one in 15,000 live births worldwide. It is diagnosed in early childhood and is characterized by symptoms such as severe developmental delays, speech impairment, problems with movement and balance, and may involve seizures. While there is no specific treatment approved, individuals with Angelman syndrome will generally have a near normal life expectancy. However, they will generally require continuous care and are unable to live independently. Normally, the paternal allele of the UB3A gene is silenced in neurons, leading to expression of only the maternal allele. In Angelman syndrome, the maternal allele is either absent or inactivated through genetic mutation, leading to loss of UB3A gene expression and impairment of synaptic connections and brain network activity. This can be visualized by an increase in low, slow brain waves or called delta waves. BIB-121 aims to remove the silencing of the paternal allele in order to restore expression of the UB3A gene. While the phase one HALO study is designed as an open label, multiple ascending dose study across age groups and dose levels to assess safety and tolerability. Importantly, the study also utilizes clinical measures that we can use to assess therapeutic potential. This includes objective EEG assessment, as well as clinical assessments evaluating multiple domains of Angelman syndrome, like cognitive function and gross and fine motor skills. The HALO study has completed enrollment for the multiple ascending dose portion of the study. And last year, IONIS presented some encouraging early interim results. Overall, safety and tolerability support continued dosing in the long-term extension, with no concerning safety trends having been observed to date. The EEG data was suggestive of early trends to a reduction of slow delta wave activity as compared to baseline. And clinician-assessed clinical endpoints show a majority of participants demonstrating some level of improvement in overall functioning. Overall, we are encouraged by these early trends and look forward to sharing a more comprehensive top-line study readout expected mid-year. Following our review of those results, Biogen will be in a position to make its decision whether to opt in to conduct a pivotal study. Moving to lupus, this is another area with significant unmet medical need. We currently have two phase three assets in systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE. First is dafirolizumab pegol, being developed in collaboration with UCB, where we expect a top-line readout of the phase three study mid-year this year. If positive, we expect to conduct a second phase three study. The second is litofilumab, our anti-BDCA2 antibody developed in-house at Biogen. We currently have two phase three studies of litofilumab in SLE ongoing. These studies are enrolling and utilize a 52 week primary endpoint. Litofilumab also has the potential to be a first in class biologic in cutaneous lupus erythematosus or CLE, a skin based autoimmune disease 
that can be associated with severe scarring and dispigmentation and can be distinct from SLA. As I've previously discussed, we have focused on reviewing our pipeline to identify and prioritize the areas where we believe we have both sufficient expertise and confidence in the science to deliver, deliver meaningful new treatments for patients. While this initial review is complete, this process remains dynamic, and we are committed to holding ourselves accountable to efficiently seeking out scientific insights and continuing to build the pipeline with what we believe is the right risk-reward balance. While we look forward to four important near-term readouts this year, we continue to focus on identifying additional near-term opportunities as well as continued expansion beyond neuroscience. Through collaboration with Jane and research organization, as well as Adam Keeney, our head of corporate development, we are taking a holistic look across the spectrum of opportunities with both a research and development focus to identify strategic assets that we believe can contribute to Biogen's growth story now and in the long term. With that, I would now like to pass the call over to Mike. Thank you, Priya. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to provide some highlights and color regarding our financial performance for the fourth quarter of 2023, and I'll follow that with some detail on our 2024 financial guidance assumptions. Uh, please note that all the financial comparisons that you will hear are versus the fourth quarter of 2022. Total revenue for the fourth quarter of 2023 was $2.4 billion. That's a decrease of 6% at actual currency and 5% at constant currency. Non-GAAP diluted earnings per share in the fourth quarter was $2.95, and that includes a $0.35 cent negative impact from the recently disclosed closeout costs related to Agihel. For the full year of 2023, total revenue of $9.8 billion represents a decline of 3% at actual currency and 1% at constant currency, and that's consistent with our most recent guidance of a low single-digit decline. Full year 2023 non-GAAP diluted EPS was $14.72, and that's also consistent with our most recent guidance range of $14.50 to $15. Total MS product revenue was $1.2 billion in the fourth quarter. That's a decrease of 8% at actual currency and 6% at constant currency. And that decline is broadly attributable to competition among the impacts from generic tech Federa. I'd like to now provide just a couple quick updates to the MS business uh, during the, the fourth quarter. First, for tech Federa in Europe, uh, in December, the European Commission revoked the centralized marketing authorization for generic versions of tech Federa. And in reaching this decision, the European Commission affirmed that Biogen is entitled to marketing protection for tech Federa until February of 2025, which makes tech Federa the only dimethylfumarate treatment for MS that may be lawfully placed on the market for sale in the EU until that date. Also, a Tysabri biosimilar has now launched in a small number of countries in Europe. We expect that uh, biosimilars will continue to launch in the first half of 2024 in other European geographies as well as in the U.S. Biogen has patents related uh, to Tysabri, and we will continue to seek to enforce our IP. And although Vumerity grew modestly in 2023, we are seeing continued effects from pricing pressure and an overall contraction of the oral segment of the market in the U.S., which we expect to continue to see in 2024. <clears throat> Now an update on our rare disease portfolio, which includes Spinraza, Skyclaris, and Calsati. In the fourth quarter, we reported revenue $472 million, which is an increase of 3% at actual currency and 6% at constant currency. On our third quarter call, we noted that Spinraza outside the U.S. benefited from the timing of shipments in certain markets. This prior period benefit negatively impacted fourth quarter performance. While we expect continued shipment timing impacts for Spinraza in 2024, we remain encouraged by its overall performance. Spinraza outside the U.S. was also modestly impacted by pricing pressure and competition in Europe in the fourth quarter. As the market leader in SMA, we continue to believe that we can return Spinraza to growth over time. 
Sky Claris delivered $56 million of revenue in the first full quarter as a Biogen product, and we are encouraged by the continued patient growth that we've seen. Mm-hmm. Biosimilars' fourth quarter revenue of $188 million increased 8% at actual currency and 10% at constant currency. We continue to explore strategic alternatives for this business and are working to ensure that we maximize its value for our shareholders. Our anti-CD20 revenue of $436 million included a $12 million operating loss related to our economics for Lonsumio. Contract manufacturing royalty and other revenue of $118 million in the fourth quarter was notably lower year over year, mainly driven by the timing of batches. And I'll provide some additional detail on this dynamic shortly when I discuss our 2024 guidance. Now, a few things to note regarding fourth quarter expenses. Fourth quarter non-GAAP cost of sales was 25% of total revenue, and that includes $52 million of idle capacity charges. Fourth quarter non-GAAP R&D expense decreased $34 million, and that's notwithstanding approximately $45 million related to our portion of the Lakembi collaboration and approximately $60 million in closeout costs relating to Agile. Non-GAAP SG&A expense decreased $44 million in the fourth quarter, which was driven by approximately $110 million in cost savings initiatives. And that was partially offset by an increase in commercialization expenses related to the launches of SkyClaris and Lakembi. Next, a brief update on our balance sheet. We ended the year with $1 billion in cash and marketable securities and $6.9 billion in debt, which puts us in a net debt position of $5.9 billion. In the fourth quarter, we utilized approximately $1.3 billion of cash for final acquisition payment obligations related to the Riata transaction. We also paid down roughly $350 million of the $1 billion term loan that we put in place at the time of this acquisition. It's important to note that included in the $1.3 billion I just mentioned, $393 million was reflected in cash flow from operations for a one-time payment related to equity-based compensation for the Riata transaction. So absent this, full year 2023 free cash flow of $1.3 billion would have been approximately $1.7 billion. We expect to continue to generate strong cash flow this year and expect to receive a payment of $437 million from Samsung in early Q2 of this year. <clears throat> so now I'm going to discuss our full year 2024 guidance ranges and assumptions. We expect full year 2024 non-GAAP diluted earnings per share of between $15 and $16, and that reflects expected EPS growth of approximately 5% at the midpoint of the range compared to 2023. While total revenue is expected to decline by a low to mid single digit percentage, we expect our core pharmaceutical revenue or product revenue plus Biogen's 50% share of Lakembi revenue net of cost of sales and royalties to be relatively flat for 2024 as compared to 2023. This assumption is driven by the expected increase in revenue from new product launches over the course of the year, roughly offsetting the declines in our MS product revenue. As has been the case in previous years, we expect Q1 to be seasonally weaker quarter as compared to Q4 for our MS business in the U.S., and that's driven by higher discounts and allowances and some channel dynamics. We also expect contract manufacturing revenue to be significantly lower throughout 2024 as compared to 2023. This is in part due to completing certain batch commitments in 2023 as part of the 2020 sale of Hillerod, uh, which is located in Denmark. We had manufacturing operations there, and these batch commitments contributed roughly $320 million in 2023, which will not recur in 2024. The increase in revenue from new product launches and decrease in contract manufacturing revenue, along with lower idle capacity charges, are expected to have a favorable impact on cost of sales as a percentage of revenue for 2024. We also believe we can grow our operating income at a low double-digit percentage and operating margins by a mid-single-digit percentage as compared to 2023. We expect this to be driven by improved cost of sales as a percentage of revenue, as well as lower expected operating expenses resulting from our Fit for Growth initiative. 
On Fit for Growth, we continue to expect to generate approximately $1 billion in growth savings and $800 million in savings net of reinvestments by 2025. We have achieved approximately $200 million of savings in 2023 and are on track to realize another $200 million in 2024, which would put us at $400 million or half of the overall net savings by the end of this year with the remainder in 2025. In 2024, we expect our 50% portion of SG&A spend for Lakembi, which as a reminder is not included in our fit for growth assumptions, and the reallocation of resources for Agilehelm to roughly offset. With all of these considerations in mind, we expect our full year 2024 combined R&D and SG&A spend to total approximately $4.3 billion. We expect our other income and expense line to continue to be a headwind this year given the reduction in interest income and increase in interest expense as a result of the RIATA acquisition. Also, and so in 2024, we expect an improving revenue profile, improved margins, and a return to non-GAAP EPS growth. Our number one goal remains to return to sustainable growth, and we remain committed to this goal and to creating long-term value for our shareholders. And now back to Chris for some closing. Thanks, Mike. Um, so we have a number of milestones this uh, year um, that we'll all be watching carefully. Uh, you've seen we have a, a scientific advisory group for McKenby, um in the first quarter, and assuming that a positive uh, result for the CNHMP, that should hopefully lead to a approval in, in uh, by the European Commission um, in the first half, uh, later in the first half of this year. Sky Claris in the European Union, of course, we've just achieved, uh, as we announced last night, um, and uh, the uh, European approval for Calsadi. Um, there's an expected decision by the CHMP and the uh, European Commission in the first half. Um, we have uh, uh, regulatory submissions coming up, as you know, with the subcutaneous formulation uh, for Lakembi and IV maintenance dosing um, also for Lakembi. And then, as Priya has noted, we have uh, four data readouts uh, expected sometime uh, mid year for four programs. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I think we are going to be spending an increasing amount of time uh, focusing on our pipeline uh, and, and building out that pipeline. So, uh, Chuck, I'm going to turn that back to you and if there's any questions. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Katie, could you please uh, open polling for questions? Thank you. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, please limit yourself to one question. If you require any further follow-up, you may press star 1 again to rejoin the queue. Our, question, our first question comes from the line of Mark Goodman with the Lee Rank Partners. Yes, good morning. Can you walk us through just the sub-queue and the maintenance approvals? Um, obviously, timelines, I guess, would be around the end of the year, but just talk about the impact into the market. Um, let's assume Lily's on the market as well. You know, they're going to get approved soon. So. How do you expect this to change the dynamics and 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 the uptake and, and just give us a sense of that, please? And and then also maybe you could just talk about the uptake in Japan that you expect. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, Priya, you want to just start with uh, kind of the timelines, and I can hit the uh, commercial. Sure. Um, thanks, Mark, for that question. So overall, you know, we shared our six-month data for the subcutaneous formulation uh, at CTAD uh, last year. We believe we've uh, achieved the bioequivalence with the IV formulation. Uh, ESI has uh, communicated very recently about the FDA meeting that is on the book to finalize uh, strategy for submission. And currently, the aim is still to file by end of March uh, 2024 for the subcutaneous formulation. In addition, there is data on the potential and need for IV maintenance, and that is also being aimed to file by Q1 um, 2024. So that's the plan currently. I'm gonna turn it over to Chris for the dynamics and the commercial implications. Yeah, so Mark, the, you know, I mean, the, the, the main benefit of the subcutaneous is going to be convenience for patients. Um, and, you know, as we talked about earlier, over time, um, we're looking at um, the AHEAD study where we could uh, potentially one day get a, an indication for uh, much earlier stage patients. We're looking at maintenance. 
where patients uh, should continue on if, if we get approved um, to prevent the um, recurrence of, of plaque. So, you know, the time on drug is expected to expand as we do these studies and, and having a subcutaneous formulation um, at any stage of this uh, disease could, could be quite beneficial. In terms of the actual competitiveness with, with denanumab, I think there's going to be a number of points. Um, you, you know, we do know that uh, physicians are highly sensitive to ARIA and, and uh, safety. Um, and we have a significantly better safety profile with Lakembi than, than denanumab. You know, there's an interesting thing with denanumab study, which, uh, you know, their study actually uh, followed patients until uh, there was a decrease in, in plaques. So where Clarity looked at uh, an endpoint for everybody at the same time point after 18 months, um, there was a variable endpoint in terms of time, on, on denanumab. And, and so the stopping criteria are not quite clear. And, and you know, I think we need to see what those are. If, if you need a PET scan, for instance, um, you know, that, that could be quite onerous. Now, we don't know whether that's going to be the case or not, but I think, I think we're going to have a number of, of variables with, with which we can uh, uh, compete with, uh, with denanumab. You know, and subcutaneous at some point will be helpful. Obviously, um, you know, if, if the Thing to Lily's guidance looks like um, denanumab is in this case going to be on the market before uh, the subcutaneous formulation is. So we're going to be focused on on uh, some of those non-subcutaneous uh, factors in competition. And then, you know, once we see the label for Lily, once we see the label for the sub-Q, then we'll we'll develop our our commercial um, strategy accordingly. Did you want to comment on Japan? Oh, in Japan, yeah. You know, I think. Uh, uh, we certainly uh, have a uh, – AZI is, is basically putting all of its field force, um, not just uh, the ones uh, for the uh, Kembe behind this. Um, and, you know, you've got a, a government-managed healthcare system, so I think some of the complexity that we have in, in the United States with reimbursement and different um, uh, actors could be simpler – um, we do expect that there will be some um, some of the same constraints in terms of access to uh, neurologists, um, the PET scans. They will probably use a lot more of the um, the CSF markers than PET scans in in Japan. But uh, you know, I think uh, uh, we we could potentially see a, a faster uptake in Japan than we saw even in the United States, just because of the uh, the, the the current system. So, you know, we're just out there since January, um, and we'll give an update, uh, obviously, again, at, at first quarter. But, um, you know, certainly from what we're hearing from our own people in the field, that uh, there's been a very positive reception by physicians in Japan. Great. Thanks, Chris. Uh, next question, please, operator. Thank you. We'll go next to Salvin Richter with Goldman Sachs. Good morning. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I have one with regard to the bottlenecks um, on the Lakembi launch. Could you speak to maybe two of those aspects? One is um, your expectations for Medicare Advantage to get to the same level of coverage as traditional Medicare um, and over what time frame? And then secondly, just an update on the, the patient access to neurologists. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'll have to get back here. I, I haven't heard anything that Medicare Advantage is any different than Medicare, so I'm, I, I haven't ever asked that question before, but I'll, I'll go check. But as far as I know, it's the same. You know, the bottlenecks, um, you, you know, are still, if you, if you think about it, if, if the data uh, from the patient registry is, are, are, are accurate, and again, we don't have direct access to that, but, you know, it suggests that we, we've got, uh, almost twice as many people on on the registry as we do on on treatment, and so that says that um, in addition to the bottleneck of getting into the neurologist, that there's you know when you get to the registry, you've got you know a clear intent to prescribe you, you, because on the registry at least for CMS, you have to describe how you actually validated the diagnosis. So by then, you've triaged the patient, you've done either the PET scan or the CSF markers. Um, and you're looking for reimbursement. And what we're hearing a little bit is, is that, you know, um, there is some challenge in just uh, scheduling the, the first MRI because uh, when we initiate the uh, infusion, you have to have the first MRI within the first two weeks. So people don't want to initiate the infusion until they've got that MRI scheduled. 
And, you know, the MRI, there isn't an MRI capacity constraint per se, but, you know, you are looking for a specific date and then you have to back up the infusion. So there's just, I think, um, in, until people get the hang of this, uh, getting all that coordination, I think that that seems to be where the uh, where one of the bottlenecks is. Thank you, Chris. Now let's move to the next question, please. We'll go next to Umar Rafat with Evercore ISI. Hi guys, thanks for taking my question. I, I thought I'd ask for something a little different today. Your CD40 phase three uh, in lupus, and my question is um, the two things. One. Uh, the trial size, this was shrunk from 450 down to 320. Could you speak to the recruiting challenges and whether they um, bode well or not well on efficacy? And then secondly, um, the primary endpoint, this one has three components, uh, but the FDA guidance appears to want one clear index like a BILAG or silinoflate I, et cetera. Is there alignment with the regulator on that? Thank you. Thank you, Umar. I'll take that. So just starting off, I think, you know, we expect our results from the first uh, phase three mid-2024. We expect that we'll need a second phase three if this is positive to generate the safety and efficacy to support a reg filing. We did make a protocol amendment, and this was really working very close, closely with Biogen and UCB, looking at the study design, balancing our commitment to execute a well-designed informative study with a desire to potentially expedite the delivery of uh, DAPI if positive to patients in need. So we do think it's appropriately powered and, you know, we continue with uh, regulatory engagements and facilitate a discussion on the next step. So we think, yes, we, it is positioned to give us a clear readout uh, on the therapeutic potential as of now, yes. Thanks, Priya. Uh, let's go to our next question, please. We'll go next to Evan Siegerman with BMO Capital Markets. Hi, all. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, Chris, maybe, can you walk me through some of the rationale for adding uh, more Biogen resources to the, the Lakemi launch? And maybe kind of what's changed or evolved with your partnership with ESI, where you think you needed to add more Biogen resources in the United States? Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Evan. Well, I mean, to be clear, we're adding both uh, more Biogen as well as more ASI. Um, you know, uh, a year ago, um, CEO of Azai and I talked about, you know, the launch of Lakembi and um, and for the U.S. Uh, just discussed uh, the, the complexity of the launch, you know, and uh, we've we've been through all that, and I won't necessarily uh, bore everybody again with that complexity, but we just felt that um, we wanted to really make sure we understood the the uh, go to market model, um, you know, in addition to these neurology account specialists. You know, you've got uh, MSLs, you've got some um, patient care navigators, uh, you've got some people looking after um, uh, KMEs in, in the region, and um, it, there's, there's, there's probably, um, for every uh, NAS, there's another two or three people who are actually out there in, in the field. And, and there's an awful lot of coordination um, that is needed, and, and even the role of the NAS is quite, uh, is, is quite complex because You've got to go in there. You've got to work with the office around um, helping them to understand the safety. Uh, you have to help them um, understand what the care pathway is. You have to help them to um, understand the reimbursement, not just for Lakimbi, but you know, there's the reimbursement for the PET scans, the MRIs, and for the care. And then finally, you, you know, there's what the what people in the field are, are, are have as a principal objective: why Lakimbi. So, so we wanted to make sure we understood all of that um, and. And to be honest, whenever you do these co-promotions, they, they require an awful lot of coordination um, between the companies. And we just felt that it would be simpler if one company went out at the start. We, we were sure that we, we knew um, exactly um, how the role of the NAS was going to work in relation to the other accompanying roles that are out there in the field. And, and we also needed to get a certain number of, of, of core IDNs um, ready and signed up. Um, because there's not a lot of point in in increasing the number of people out in the field unless you've got enough uh, sites that are activated and 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 ready. So you know now we're more than six months into the launch. I think we feel very comfortable about how the role of the NAS works. Um, um, we understand how long it takes between you know going to visit um, a, a, a neurologist or an IDN and 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 how long it's going to take for them to be activated. Because it, it, say there's 
you, you can put an awful lot of resource out there, but if, if, if you're not able to pull the drug through, it's not a very efficient uh, process. So that's that's just where we are. We're we're confident in that model. Obviously, um, it is. Uh, we, we need to now reach out to more sites. So we're looking at this from both a geographic expansion, but also I think um, you know even within certain geographies, uh, perhaps reducing the territory size because you know when these NASAs go in, they spend quite a long time with the uh, the specialists. So uh, it was always uh, the agreement between the two CEOs that when we scale up, that Biogen would come in. Um, but we both, you know, our, our objective is to make the joint venture as efficient as possible. And, and so we just felt that uh, the, the, the efficiency at the start would be maximized um, if we had one company on the field. Now, we've obviously learned from that, and, and, and that's what also gives us the confidence to put two companies out into the field immediately in, in Japan, for example, because I mean, while there are differences in the market, a, a number of the dynamics would be the same pretty much in, in, in most markets. So it is an increase. Um, uh, Azi is increasing their resource, and, so, and, and Biogen will be out there as well. And, and that, that could still evolve over time. You know, we're, we're going to be in this business together for many years to come. Right, thanks, Chris. Uh, let's move to our next question, please. We'll go next to Paul Matias with uh, Stiefel. Hi, this is James on for Paul. Thanks for taking our question. <clears throat> Just one more on the lecanemab sub Q and specifically in treatment naive patients. Just wondering <clears throat> if you you know you're confident that you have enough data from you know a regulatory perspective here. If if you've aligned with regulators, you and ESI aligned with regulators and Specifically, if you have enough safety data in that treatment-naive patient population. Any color there would be great. Thanks. So, so yes, overall, you know, this has been uh, a topic that we've discussed, ASI and Biogen have discussed uh, with the FDA. And just to step back, the design was uh, to add a sub-study, a subcutaneous sub-study in the Phase three Clarity Study open-label extension. And the cohort that was treatment naive from lecanemab was about 72 patients. And then there was a whole cohort of 322 additional patients that provided safety and tolerability. So this was the, the 72 patients is the premise for the PKPD and bioequivalence, but there's a larger subset of data that speaks to the safety data. So yes, discussions are ongoing, but overall these have been discussed uh, with regulators prior to starting them. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Brian. Uh, next question, please. We'll go next to Phil Nadu with TD Cowan. Good morning. A question on Sky Claris following last night's approval in the EU. Uh, Chris highlighted the importance of the ex US markets. Um, could you discuss the expected cadence and trajectory of Sky Claris's launch outside the US and in Europe in particular? When will it be available in the major territories? And would you expect the uptake in those major territories to be as fast as it has been here in the United States? Thanks. So there's uh, there's two aspects, I guess, to the launch. One is the uh, uh, early access programs, and and the other is the formal launch. So, um, for example, uh, we will be able to launch now in Germany um, with this approval. Um, so we will. This will be a formal launch. We we. Uh, um, still have an early access program, and, and any patients on that will now convert to commercial patients, remembering that um, actually the patients in early access programs in, in Europe are, are expected to be revenue generating for the most part. We have another program that's up and running in France, and we are um, negotiating uh, uh, the establishment of early access programs in, in two other European countries, and there are some uh, early access programs under discussion in, in countries outside of the EU. And the early access programs are important because, as we all know, in Europe, getting pricing and reimbursement can take some time. So um, it's a little hard to predict um, just because, we, you know, we have to understand the cadence of these early access programs. So I would expect that it's not going to be quite as fast as it was in, in the U.S. Uh, that said, uh, you, you know, I there is some um, um, suggestion that there are some patients, the warehousing effect could well be in, in Europe, but as a sale, and as a general matter, just because of the time to get um, reimbursement in all countries and the fact that we are not gonna be able to have early access programs 
in all countries, um, that that will be a slower uptake than in, in the U.S. Um, that said, there's also probably more patients actually per capita. Remember, this is a disease that is related to European descent. And, and so the incidence of Friedrich's ataxia is slightly higher um, in, in Europe than it is in the U.S. The next big uh, um, market opportunity would be Latin America, and we are submitting uh, in Brazil. And perhaps, uh, Pray, you can give us an update on the regulatory timelines there. Yes. I can comment on the fact that uh, really we are trying to uh, expedite our regulatory filings in Latin America, Brazil, Argentina. We haven't yet communicated the timelines, but our teams are working very expeditiously, meeting with regulators to really define the pathways that could provide uh, earliest access to patients. We estimate, um, it's hard to get the numbers precisely, but we do estimate there's around two to 4,000 patients in, in Latin America. So uh, we, and, and when we look at the experience of Spinraza, um, we are expecting um, particularly Latin America to contribute uh, substantially to our revenue um, uh, outlook as well. As you know, there are very few patients in Asia um, uh, just because of the uh, genetics. So we, we, we don't intend to be filing or launching in, in Asia. Great, right, thank you. Uh, next question, please. We'll go next to Michael Yi with Jeffries. Thanks. Uh, we had a question on uh, Sky Claris. Can you uh, maybe shed some more light on the dynamics of 800 patients to 1,000 and then the trajectory as we go forward into 2024? I know you mentioned there's about 4,000 patients, but how many of those are actually identified? And do you expect growth to moderate just from an expectation standpoint? Talk a little bit about the complexities in, in 2024 that you commented about. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, that, certainly, the growth is going to moderate. Uh, you know, uh, remember this was a um, at, when this product was in the hands of Riata, they had uh, approval. I think it was back in the first quarter. I think it was February, if I remember accurately. And but they were not able to commercially launch because of a manufacturing specification issue. So uh, and that did not get cleared until July. So in other words, the market and 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 physicians knew. The product would be coming to the market that it was approved, and um, and and they were just waiting for uh, product availability. So I think the the warehousing effect was even greater than what you would normally see for any rare disease um, drug. Now we're back into the process of finding the patients. Um, I have to say, the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance, otherwise known as FARA, is an extraordinarily effective patient uh, association and. Um, and, and we're working with them to help uh, identify patients. You know, there is a requirement uh, really to, to, to diagnose a patient accurately, a genetic test, um, but this genetic test is not so uh, readily available, and, and so we're having to, to look and, and make sure that the supplier of that test can make the, the tests uh, readily available. Um, and then we're also doing the contracting uh, Really, to make sure that as patients have start forms, that they can they can quickly um, get on on drug. So we'll be we'll be back to a I think a regular uh, growth cadence on Sky Claris in in the U.S. Um, I don't think we're necessarily going to get another 20% this year, but you know we're we're growing every every month, and uh, certainly uh, Sky Claris is is contributing significantly to our return to growth in in 2024. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, let's move to our next question, please. We'll go next to Colin Briscoe with UBS. Hey, good morning, and thanks for taking the questions. Um, I just wanted to clarify something. In your slides, it says that the, the subcut that we can be filing is now first half of 24, but in your commentary, it sounds like it's still 1Q24. Um, so if you could just clarify that and, and just talk to specifically what FDA is waiting to see. I, I think it was a 12 month data last time we spoke, but what, it is, what is it within that? And then maybe just um, as a follow on, the AHEAD 345 study, um, what are the timing or thresholds for any interim analysis there? Thank you. I can get started. Um, so overall, I think with the subcutaneous, just to be very clear, uh, ESI has communicated as recently as their earnings a few days ago that we aim to file by Q1 2024, which is 
end of uh, the first quarter this year. And um, just shifting gears to ahead three, four, five, this is really a, a, a platform set of platform trials with different amyloid uh, levels for defining preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So at a very high level, A45 is preclinical uh, pre Alzheimer's disease with an enrollment target of 1,000 patients, and uh, patients need to have an amyloid level of 40 centiloids or more. There's three phases of dosing with different doses, which is titration, induction, and maintenance. And in this particular uh, trial, the outcome is a PAC-5, which is a preclinical composite for Alzheimer's disease, where it's sensitive to patients who are still in the preclinical phase. The A3 trial is, has a target enrollment of about 400, and the preclinical uh, amyloid cutoff is between 20 and 40 centiloids. And then again, it's got a different dosing schedule of uh, titration and then maintenance. Now, the primary endpoint for the A3 trial is really a biomarker endpoint. We haven't really communicated uh, exact timelines. These are very large trials. I think we have, uh, ESA and Biogen are very pleased with how they're being enrolled. And I think we'll communicate more. There is an opportunity to do an interim analysis. Uh, and, I, and Isai has spoken to this, but we haven't communicated a timeline yet. And Colin, just, just a quick note on slide 28, right? Um, the dots, that does show Q1, right? We have a wording that says expected mid-year if there's something sort of in the middle of the year. So I get the, I get the confusion because it says half one, half two, but the dots are kind of <laughs> at the end of, end of the quarter there. So if you were looking at, see if there was a disconnect, there, there's not, it is, uh, they have said in, in uh, the end of March is what we're looking at here. So thank you. Priya, thanks. For I think there was a latter part of the question. I'll just wrap it up. That um, with regards to FDA, I think I mentioned previously, there have been a lot of discussions. ESA has recently mentioned the scheduling of more meeting, another meeting. And so that strategy will be finalized. Looking at the six-month data, we are very encouraged with what we saw. We believe that the highest threshold, really, the biggest hurdle was to meet bioequivalence, which we believe we've met. So we'll continue to wait for more data, but we are very encouraged with what we've seen so far. All right. Thank you, Priya. Uh, let's go to our next questioner. We'll go next to Chris Raymond with Piper Sandler. Hey, um, thanks. I, I wanted to um, maybe circle back on the Angelman's program, and I wanted to understand a little bit better Priya's commentary around the program. Can you maybe clarify the calculus that goes into deciding to participate in future development? And, you know, obviously there's a competitive approach um, with Ultragenics' program. Curious how you're thinking about, um, you know, approvable endpoints. Um, they, they, you know, there's, that's obviously been a big question mark. And, and how you think this, this product, you know, if successful, would, would sort of compare and, you know, any sort of commentary there in terms of the competitive set. Thanks. Sure, sure. So overall, just to step back, this is a program that IONIS, uh, our partner, is operationalizing. And the way the contractual agreements are written, you know, we have the option of opting in to take the data that we see mid-year and decide whether we would like to do a pivotal program, a pivotal study. So that's how it's set up. And then to st uh, step back, I described it briefly uh, in my opening remarks that this is a phase 1B trial. So this is a phase 1 trial that's being conducted in patients. It has a multiple ascending dose component for three months, followed by uh, a long-term extension. So we will get data. This is across different age groups and different doses. So we'll get a composite of data. And importantly, we'll be looking for uh, trends on EEG, which, you know, we, we know these patients suffer from the delta waves, as I spoke to, the slowing. So we'll be looking at that, as well as clinical endpoints. And very specifically, there are quite a few clinical endpoints. There's the Bailey score, there's the CGI, and there's the Vineland. We'll be looking at all of them. Stepping out into what do we feel about the competitive landscape, we, we feel that this, uh, you know, as designed, the program is well positioned. Just from an ASO perspective, the backbone of the BIB-121 ASO, we believe, is different. That's one from the Ultragenics, um, you know, uh, ASO. 
Second, we believe that the dosing may be needed at a quarterly level to really see the PKPD impact that we need to have make an impact in this disease. And we do have a, a three-monthly dosing in the LTE. So the MAD is two doses being given one month apart, and then the third dose two months later, and then patients go into a three-month dosing. So we, are, we feel that we will have a data set that we can look at and really assess whether we see uh, an adequate signal to really take it into a phase three. And with regards to, uh, you know, Roche discontinuing their program, we believe, again, that this is a different uh, product, and we believe uh, we may have a competitive advantage. Ultimately, of course, we need, the, we need to see the data. Thank you, Priya. Uh, let's move to the next question, please. We'll go next to Mohit Balsal with Wells Fargo. Hey, thank you very much for taking my question. Uh, maybe I can, uh, if you can comment a little bit on the co previous comment you made uh, regarding uh, uh, Spinraza return to growth. Uh, what is happening in the market right now, and how do you plan to uh, get back to growth on this product? Thank you. Sure. So. As you know, we have an oral therapy out there, we have a gene therapy, and, and we have Spinraza with the uh, intrathecal. Um, so short term, um, you know, I think one of the, the uh, data points that was very important was was demonstrating the efficacy of Spinraza uh, following Solgensma, um, because there has been some um, feeling that Solgensma wanes over time. So we're getting what we call switchbacks um, and, the, and the other on the uh, uh, oral therapy is that there, there has sometimes appeared to be that uh, the efficacy is, is limited to certain body weights. So we, we can actually um, go after um, more adult uh, populations. It's, it's the ex we believe that only about 30% of, of patients with SMA are actually treated. Clearly, the, the pediatric patients uh, are screened for and, and readily identified. But there are a number of adult pop, uh, uh, patients where the disease is 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 manifest, but it, it it is sometimes difficult to diagnose. And so we're back to the uh, rare disease uh, job of 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 hunting for patients. Um, but we think actually we will be the most appropriate patient, uh, uh, most appropriate treatment for that patient population. So that's one source of growth. And then. Longer term, um, as you know, we have a high-dose uh, Spinraza program in development, um, which could, if it's successful, um, lead to just one intrathecal injection per year, and, and that would make um, an enormous difference to patients in terms of patient convenience and, and make Spinraza even more competitive <clears throat> uh, compared to, uh, to the others. Now, that's still going to take a number of years, but we do expect that still to come to market before the patent on uh, Spinraza occurs. Yeah, and I'll just quickly add to that, Mohit, that in the, um, you know, as we mentioned in our prepared remarks, there tends to be some um, some lumpiness quarter over quarter, particularly outside of the U.S. With, with shipments. But overall, when you look at the full year of 2023, we actually saw modest growth in the U.S., modest decline, OUS, and um, overall, you know, moving back toward, uh, toward um, you know, the, the, the uh, modest growth trajectory that we're hoping for, and we, we are pleased with uh, how that franchise has stabilized over time. Yeah, there's a dynamic as sort of the, as the oral comes into a market at one point or the gene therapy comes into a market. You know, if you have 100% market share and a competitor comes in, mathematically you're going to lose market share. But, but what we see is, is that um, there is some churn for a year or two and and then the market settle out, and and that's when people start focusing on efficacy and patient populations. And as I say, so far we have been able to maintain leadership in in SMA despite the uh, the competition. And I think that's where they'll be. There'll be different um, products for different patients, but um, there's still enough of a patient population, and and even with these switchbacks that we we can find uh, reservoirs of growth. Great, thanks. And operator, can we move to our last question, please? We'll go next to Jay Olson with Oppenheimer. Hey guys, this is Matt on for Jay. Uh, thanks so much for taking our questions in Jay sends his regards. Um, so we were wondering, I guess it's still early, of course, but the PPD launch so far, just in terms of any metrics or signals that you see um, that support your confidence in the launch so far, and of course, over the next few months to quarters, what kind of metrics do you believe will become meaningful and, and that you might plan to share? And maybe just your overall 
um, longer term uh, goals for that CPD launch and your general interest in the psychiatry space would be uh, interesting to hear as well. I really appreciate the question. Sure. Um, uh, thanks, uh, Stunt Double. Um, we um, so there are a number of things that that I think are quite encouraging. One is, um, you know, our our initial target has been high prescribing psychiatrists in this space, as as well as um, OBGYNs. And and one of the things that uh, we were wondering about is, uh, are the OBGYNs really going to be um, willing to prescribe. And so one of the uh, encouraging signs is that they, in fact, are doing so. Um, so we're seeing quite a high percentage of the prescriptions coming from them. Uh, another has been, I think, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, payers have, have really wanted to ensure access uh, to patients. Um, and as I say, I'm, I'm quite thankful to them. I think uh, uh, Medicaid, uh, for example, where 40% of births occur, have moved uh, very quickly uh, on that in, in, in a number of states. Um, and some of the large, at least one of the large con, uh, in commercial insurers is, is uh, moving uh, much quicker than, than we expected as well. So I think, um, you know, the reimbursement uh, is, is, a, is a key statistic. Now, personally, I, I'm, I'm interested in knowing how many uh, patients are treatment naive versus people who have been on, on treatment. You know, what what is interesting is, is there a warehousing effect here as well? There's been an awful lot of media coverage. Um, the product was approved in, in July. Um, we, we were not able to launch uh, because of the DEA inspection until the, uh, the very end of, of 2023. So what we don't know is, uh, are we seeing a bolus of patients come in because uh, uh, these are patients physicians have been following for some time who've been identified as being um, uh, particularly uh, important for to have uh, as a survey. Um, so, you know, I think we'll need to see a little bit more data about um, who are the patients and and where are they coming from. But as I say, so far we're 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 running. Um, you know, for the first month, I mean, we're certainly doing much better than than, than what we had anticipated. And uh, you know, we'll give you another update at, at Q1. Uh, we'll sit with Sage. Uh, uh, sometime in March to look at the data and say, uh, you know, what what do we see as, as some of the trends? But so far, um, so good. All right, thanks, Chris. And uh, that will conclude our call. Appreciate you all joining us today. That concludes today's call. We appreciate your participation. You may now disconnect.